This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. The difference between a high-performing workplace and one that just does a job is quite stark. High-performing workplaces with progressive leaders are up to 12% more productive and three times more profitable than their peers. Many companies want to become high-performing. To help them to achieve it in Australia, the federal government has funded a two-year project to understand why and how some organisations are better than others as part of an ongoing campaign to encourage innovation in the workplace. Dr. Christina Bodker from the Australian School of Business co-led the study. She discusses the results with Professor Kieran Ma from the ANU. So one of the key motivations for the study was the changing nature of the economy, um, including the changing nature of businesses and the resources that they draw on to, to create economic value. Another motivation for doing the study was uh, federal government was becoming increasingly interested in productivity, and we believe that it is at the heart, you know, of the workplace um, that productivity is achieved. It's every individual worker. So we've got to sort of break that down and look more closely at the work, workplace environment. Kieran, you did some great work in terms of um, looking at the contributions to GDP of the services sector and, and it's something like 76% of industry value. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that so much of the research on organisations looks at manufacturing yes. firms and they're such a small part now of, of the economy of most developed countries and Australia is very typical in that regard. It's around 76% of the industry contribution to GDP. Yes, and making up for something like 85% of Australian employment. So in other words, 85% of Australian employees are employed in the, in the services sector. So if we want to make Australia better, <laughs> we've got to look to the services sector, really. Uh, so part of the motivations of the study was, was really to uh, work with a larger group of organisations um, with a view to understand uh, the performance of their intangible assets, uh, their human capital. Um, the relationships that they have with their customers uh, and also the leadership skills and their uh, internal management systems and processes. So we've ended up working with uh, law firms, consulting firms, advertising agencies, uh, employment agencies, um, etc, etc. We put together a team of researchers that uh, come from these different disciplinary areas uh, and that hasn't always been easy because uh, accountants speak a different language to the HR people, to the IT people and, and to the economists. Um, but I think what we've found and what we've learned is that there are, uh, you know, quite a bit of overlap. So there was a lot of synergies, I think, between the different areas, mm. the human resource management, the accounting, the information systems, economics. Yes. I think one of the surprising things that came out of the, the study for me is the government asked us to to look at productivity. And traditionally, that's something that we think of in economics as being driven a lot by the capital component. And when we did the calculations, we found out that the capital was, was not significant for these firms. Mm. It was all about the labor and the, the intangible aspects mm. of, the, of the firm's leadership, um, the, the employee experience, innovation, those kinds of mm. things. So we came at the studies uh, from a bit of an accounting angle, I would say, and, uh, and also the economics literatures. Um, but accounting, especially in regards to not being able to um, account very well for these intangible assets that uh, inform value creation and economic production in, in the services uh, industry. So we're very good at capturing on our balance sheets the tangible assets, machinery, equipment, etc. But, but capturing the value of these intangibles is a lot harder. What we uh, started off by doing was we created a high-performing workplace index that uh, used 18 performance measures uh, from across six categories, um, which combined sort of the financial and productivity element that Kieran mentioned before uh, with employee experiences, customer orientation, fairness, leadership and innovation. 
each uh, organization got a score on the index. Um, it gave uh, us the position of, of that individual organization. We send out reports to those organizations. And uh, I suppose a good example of a study that uh, interacts with industry to, yes, give us a great database of uh, information about leadership and management practices and productivity effects in, in Australian workplaces, but at the same time give something back to the organisations that we've been working with. So they actually got more than 100 pages of benchmarking information. Um, but in aggregating the data, we were able to um, do an analysis that enabled us to uh, identify those companies that seem to achieve superior performance uh, compared to the rest. Um, and that was only about 15% of the sample. And so one standard deviation above... Above, above the, the mean, yeah. yeah. And similarly, we charted the performance of another cluster, which was uh, one standard deviation below the mean, which gave us uh, what we call the lower performing organisations. Um, and we were then able to chart the performance differences. Um, and what we saw, for example, was that the higher performing workplaces were up to uh, three times more profitable, up to 12% more productive um, than, than some of their peers. There was also um, a superior performance on the intangible aspects, uh, including employee experiences and innovation, et cetera, et cetera. It was interesting to see that the ideas that were out there in the literature and, and in business actually mm. did show up in the data as well, that these things were all mm. very highly correlated. And so I think it suggests the importance of complementarities in, in business, that you've got to get the right mm. array of, of practices. Yes. And so you see the good performing firms do all those things. So it's not just about innovating or being good at your financials. It's about giving consideration to um, a diverse range of, of elements, the customer, of course, and the employee experience, um, and even fairness. Fairness we found to be quite significant. And that makes a lot more sense when you, when you think about it. Initially, fairness sounds like it's kind of disconnected. But mm -hmm. when you think that fairness is about the way in which you're treated in the processes of, of work mm -hmm. and whether you're rewarded for your effort, it makes a lot of sense. Firms in which you're treated in a somewhat arbitrary way by your boss seem to be places where people mm -hmm. perform less well. Yes, and that stood out because we, we separated out the six categories and we found that leadership and innovation had um, the highest correlation with profitability and profit. The leadership skills that seemed to, to come through uh, with the data was around the ability of leaders to involve people in decision-making processes um, was a very significant characteristic. Um, being receptive and even welcoming uh, criticism and, and feedback, uh, practicing um, and not just preaching the values but also practicing and living the values and having a clear vision uh, for the team or the work group or the department that, that uh, you're leading uh, came out as, as being uh, quite significant attributes of, of, of leaders. In, uh, and these think, the kinds of things were much more highly correlated than things like the amount of money you spent on it information technology mm. or how much training you provided to to employees yes. those things needed to be they were important but they needed to be matched in mm. with these other aspects of the of yes. the firm and the other thing that came out as being quite significant was uh, the flexibility of the organization to respond to changes in its environment i think had one of the highest correlations with the index as well so being able to detect and adapt to changes uh, in say technology and customer needs and the other last thing i suppose we could mention was uh, positive emotions seem to be more prevalent in the higher performing organizations so feeling enthusiastic feeling cheerful um, feeling proud and feeling valued whereas uh, and you sort of flip the coin here, the negative emotions, uh, higher levels of anxiety, um, uh, people were more worried and uh, depression was higher uh, in the lower performing uh, workplaces. And those, those levels of negative emotion were at very high yes. uh, frequency in the poor performing firms. One in four, yeah. I think it was, yes. people reported feeling depressed. Versus one in seven in the higher performing category. It's almost twice as many people feeling yeah. depressed. Um, but one in four, that's 25%. That's if you sit with your work team, you know, you look around and you're almost sure to be sitting next to a colleague that, you know, feels depressed about the workplace. But obviously what we'd like to do is 
not just see that, but see how we could change the, the poorer performing firms. And so those associations tell us the levers to try and pull. But I think the big open question out there, both for government policy and, and as researchers or for, for business leaders, is which levers actually mm. can you make a difference with? How much can you change something and how much impact does that have? You know, mm. is leadership something that's stuck in a person's personality and that's it? And then how much does having a good leader or a bad leader, mm. you know, impact immediately? And so that's what we're doing in the second phase of the project. We're following a smaller group of organizations as they work with consultants uh, who are there to help the organizations uh, lift their performance by intervening in the areas of leadership, culture and management practices to look at the performance differences that these interventions uh, potentially has. At a policy level, the uh, study has been very well received. Um, it was launched at the uh, Future Jobs Forum in Canberra on October the 6th, and the Prime Minister was so kind to mention it, both in her opening and closing speeches, and attend the actual launch uh, event, which was chaired by Minister Evans. And so I think we've had really good traction uh, in terms of feeding back and, and working together with um, federal government and, and policy makers to get the message out there. Forefront in the world in terms of policy in this area. I mean, traditionally you either believed all firms were efficient and markets worked perfectly mm. or you thought that maybe the government had to pick winners and put up trade barriers and give subsidies. And yes. this is you know, an alternative view in which Firms vary in how well they they perform, but instead mm. of giving them subsidies, we try and lift their performance instead of instead of just protecting them. Mm. And I think that's got to be the future for for Australia.